Good morning, DBC family, and welcome to our Sunday service for this week, May the 3rd. I'm Doug Martin, or some of my little friends like to call me, Rocket Man. And I'm inviting you to join me in today's call to worship. Scripture says we are to bless the Lord at all times. As his church, we have this unique opportunity to praise his name together and make much of him, as in Psalm 34, 1-3 states. Reminds and encourages us to magnify the Lord together in this place today. So please join me in reading these words out loud together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let us worship together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in This is my story. 
morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to welcome you to our digital Sunday service this morning. Uh, I've been continuing to read through the book of Mark in my personal devotions. And the thing about reading the book of Mark is it almost gives you whiplash. You know, it's event after event after event, and it's all so very fast as, as he covers the different things that Jesus did and the things he said while he was here on earth in a very short period of time. And and as I read through it, you know, seeing miracle after miracle, Jesus healing, resurrecting, feeding people, calming storms, you know, I was just reminded of the incredible power of God, Uh, that this God who is still at work today using that same power, and he's using that power in our lives to to shape us and to grow us. I also watched Pastor Dennis's interview with two of our global partners, Scott and Patsy Bueller, and they shared this story about an incredible shift in the lives of a couple whose marriage was in shambles. And and it just brought me so much comfort and encouragement. You know, not because my marriage is in shambles, but because I know that this all-powerful God who's performing the miracles I read in the Bible is at work in me. And that there's, there's nothing, whether it's a pandemic or isolation or my own sinfulness, that, that he's not able to overcome. And as we go through this week, I hope that you too are encouraged by the incredible power of God and that you can see his power in your lives. We just have a couple other things to get through today. Uh, We just want to thank you for your continued connections with each other, as well as your continued engagement with the various resources and videos that we've had the opportunity to put out. You know, we want to encourage you to continue to check out these resources. Uh, You know, whether it's our prayer videos on Monday or our Kids Eat Free videos on Tuesday or our our DBC Connections on Thursday or our Family Fun Fridays on Friday, uh, our hope is that these materials can be an encouragement to you and your families and as well give you different ways that you can be intentional and start intentional conversations in your homes. If you want access to these videos or you just don't really know where to find them, you can check out our website at downminibiblechurch.ca uh, and they have links to all of these videos uh, that is updated regularly. Hopefully these resources can be just a great benefit to you and your family. Something else that we think is really important and really encouraging is the ability to connect with each other. You know, I, I've really appreciated having the warmer weather so I can actually be outside and have social distance conversations with people. Uh, And so we want to continue to encourage you to make connections uh, a part of your day after the service. You know, a key part of Sunday morning services is being able to connect with each other uh, in the foyer. That's what we we, we did all the time when we were actually physically able to be together. And so now it's a little different, uh, but we want to encourage you to still have those conversations, you know, with two or three people after you watch this video, whether you watch it in the morning or the evening or on Monday or whenever it is. Send a text, give a call, have some sort of social distance conversation. You know, it's just ways that we can continue to stay connected to each other. You know, along with this video, we're going to send out a couple of really great questions that can, you can use as conversation starters to sort of get the ball rolling in these conversations you know, and, and go a little deeper in your conversations. And finally, as always, we just want to thank you for your continued generosity in financially supporting Dominey Bible Church and our global partners. You know, we can't do what we're able to do without your support, both financially and in prayer. So we just want to thank you, and we can't thank you enough. Before we move to a time of prayer, we just have a brief update from one of our global partners, Greg Benson, who serves with Ranger Lake Bible Camp. Hey, Dalmany Bible Church, Greg Benson here. Going to do a little uh, spotlight on Ranger Lake. Usually I give these in person at the church, and whenever I do, I always say thank you. Thank you so much for being one of the Benson family's first supporters in our foray into uh, local mission work. We've been missionaries since 2001. Dalmany Bible Church has supported us monthly ever since we uh, answered the call to go. So thank you very much. Uh, Ranger Lake Bible Camp exists uh, to tell kids about Jesus and to take those who know about Jesus and train them to tell others about Jesus. That's what we do, and we've done it since 1952. It blows my mind to think that things are gonna be much different this summer, much different than any summer that we've had before. And as we near camp, as we near the camp season, it becomes more and more evident that we're gonna have to make some plans to accommodate for that. So right now, Ranger Lake is planning on ministering this summer. We hope it involves having children on our property. We still have plans in place. We have our volunteer team. We have a lot of our paid staff, our paid summer missionaries in place to make sure that ministry can happen. If it's not possible, we've been working with One Hope Canada, that's our parent organization, 
in developing a My Camp app that would allow children to be able to do camp activities with a cabin leader in a virtual space. And the good news is because it's our app, because it's been developed professionally, and believe me, it's really nice. Because of all those things, it's very secure. And so it was meant for follow-up initially, but we might use it for a virtual camp this summer. Regardless of what the future holds, ministry is gonna go on at Ranger Lake Bible Camp. Children this summer will get to hear the good news. Children this summer will be discipled, and we will have summer missionaries that are going to be engaged in reaching children for Christ. Can I ask you to keep praying for us? Can I ask you as well, if the Lord leads it on your heart, to give to our ministry, to continue supporting us? We sure appreciate that. These are unprecedented times, and uh, we know that God works best in our greatest trials. So let's not give up on sharing the good news with those around us. Let's not give up supporting missions work, certainly at Ranger Lake Bible Camp as well. Thanks so much, and I'll talk to you soon, hopefully face-to-face. Bye-bye. We'll now uh, just move into a time of prayer. And the words that I ask you to, to say with me are, we praise you, almighty God. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have to just to worship you together. And while we can't physically be together, I thank you that you continue to unite us with each other and with you. May we not lose connection with each other, and would you give us the opportunities and the initiative to be an encouragement to each other. Thank you for this body, the church, that you have created to support each other through thick and thin. We praise you, Almighty God. We pray for our nation as we continue to fight against this pandemic. We pray for our leaders, that you would give them the wisdom as we begin to slowly reopen. Uh, we pray for our healthcare workers as they continue to stand on the front lines. I just pray that you protect them as they help those who are hurting. We pray for those specifically who are living in the Losh and Lloyd Minister, Lloyd Minster and those areas as, as they deal with outbreaks. Give the people peace and comfort and, and bring healing to those who are sick. We praise you, Almighty God. And we pray for Ranger Lake Bible Camp and, and all the other summer camps who are being forced to reinvent what their summer programs look like. I pray that you would bring wisdom and guidance to the leaders as they navigate this difficult situation. And I just pray that they would not get discouraged and that they would know that you are still at work. I pray that you would be using these Bible camps this summer to just have an incredible impact on the lives of children despite the unique circumstances. We praise you, Almighty God. We pray for our other global partners who are finding different ways to serve you in their context. Help them to feel your presence and your guidance as they make decisions. I pray that, that you would continue to use them to do great things for you in the lives of the people that they come in contact with. And I pray for us as well, that in the midst of this, you would also give us the boldness and the opportunities to be a light for your truth to the people around us, in our workplaces, in our homes, and in our neighborhoods. Thank you that you are at work in us and through us. We praise you, Almighty God. And God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your great power, that you are the creator of the universe and more powerful than anything imaginable. And yet you reach into each and every one of our lives and you are at work guiding us and protecting us. Thank you for your love for us, even when we don't deserve it. May we continue to trust in you and in your power. We praise you, almighty God. Amen. As a kid growing up in church, I learned a song that went like this. I will come and bow down at your feet, Lord Jesus. In your presence is fullness of joy. There is nothing, there is no one who compares with you. I take pleasure in worshiping you, Lord. Singing songs of praise is one way we can worship God. It doesn't matter so much how we worship God, but it matters that we do it. We are to worship him with our lives. I know I speak for all of our church musicians when I say that being a part of our online church service is a tremendous privilege and also an important responsibility. But whether we are on stage or sitting alone on a couch at home, we're all instruments of praise to a holy God. As you minister to the Lord in song, he will minister to you. Whatever we give to him, he will richly repay. So again, I'll say it. 
I will come and bow down at your feet, Lord Jesus. In your presence is fullness of joy. There is nothing, there is no one who compares with you. I take pleasure in worshiping you, Lord. Welcome today to our May 3rd service. 
Last Sunday, Melissa drew our attention to a resource called Stuck at Home. After the service, she posted it on the DBC members' Facebook. And in case you haven't looked at it, I would like to review the introductory material, which gives us God's perspective from Scripture on the opportunities that being stuck at home with your family provide. It gives four principles. The first is the legacy principle. Scripture tells us that what we do today directly influences the multi-generational cycle of family traits, beliefs, and actions for good or bad. Passing a strong faith to our children begins by having a strong faith ourselves and modeling the gospel in our marriages and family. There's the likelihood principle. Proverbs 22.6 tells us that when children learn right from wrong at home under the nurturing, loving training of parents, they tend to adopt mom and dad's beliefs. While there are no guarantees because every child has a free will, kids are far more likely to embrace their parents' faith if they have a strong relationship with mom and dad. The lens is principle. Jesus taught that our enemy's primary weapon is deception getting us to believe and live according to lies rather than the truth. Our children are growing up in a culture that bombards them with lies. An hour or two a week at church? That's no match for the hundreds of hours spent with media, school, and friends. Nor can it compete with a child's fallen nature that often wants to rebel against what is good, true, and beautiful. It's the job of parents to equip children with the corrective lenses of truth so they can better navigate the deceptive roads of life. There's the learning principle. Jesus often expressed the message of the gospel through word pictures. Our children can only learn what we teach them in a manner that will reach them. We need to vary our approach based upon their unique personalities, their learning styles, and most importantly, the stages of their development. I think these principles are more valuable and challenging than the resources that went along with them. God has placed a calling on parents to lead and equip our children to grow in responsibility, maturity, and faith. And as we will see in today's text, that is what God also wants to take place within the community of faith. He has provided for those who've been restored and are being restored through Jesus, this wonderful opportunity. Last week, we read about enjoying and protecting the unity he created. Now we read how that unity is to be accomplished. And so I've entitled this message, Ministry Together in God's Story. By way of review, we're reminded of what God wants to accomplish in us. It says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The next 10 verses we're going to look at explain what those works, those ministries are, and how we're able to demonstrate this unity most effectively. These 10 verses consist of two sentences, sounds just like Paul, his long sentences, that can be summed up in this way. In verses 7 to 10, God gives every member a gift of grace to do ministry together. And in 11 to 16, God gives gifts of leadership to equip us for ministry together. We'll look at those again soon. As we go through this section, I want you to think of three groups of people. First of all, yourself. God gives all of us general responsibilities but he gives each one of us specific gifting to minister to one another, our families, and our community. I'm going to think of those who lead. God gives specific gifting to leaders who are then given the responsibility of ensuring that everyone is doing ministry together. The third group is those you lead. Most, if not all of us, lead somebody. Think of your responsibility to those under your leadership. Let's look first at verses 7 to 10. God gives every member a gift of grace to do ministry together. Here's what it says. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? 
He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Grace was given to each one of us. In the previous section, the word one emphasized a core truth or person that brings us together. Here, one refers to each individual. Every person who becomes God's workmanship created in Christ for good works. Every individual that is a member of this united community. If you're listening to this and identify as a follower of Jesus, this one includes you. You've been given grace. We read in, read in verse, chapter 2, verse 8, that God has generously saved us. Then in chapter 3, verses 2 and 7, God generously invites us to share what he's done for us with others. We don't deserve either of those, but God gives this grace to us. Now he gives us more grace. Well, what does he give us? He gives us a gift. A gift, like a gift of knives for signing up or a gift of three months interest-free? What is the gift? Well, if you read all the way to verse 16, you see that he refers to us as each part who is doing their work properly and that this gift is meant to help build up the church. If we take this information and cross-reference it with what Paul wrote in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, Jesus gives to each of us specific abilities for the benefit of the body. And when it says he gives gifts according to his measure, well, that means he doesn't give dysfunctional, menial, or unfulfilling gifts. No, they're amazing. In verses 8 to 10, it, it quotes Psalm 68, 18. And Psalm 68 is a song that praises God as a mighty warrior who achieves victory over all his enemies and ascends to his throne as a conqueror. Paul compares by using that text what Jesus did to this imagery. Jesus came from heaven to earth to live as one of us. And in death, Jesus descended to the underworld to demonstrate to the powers of darkness, he defeated their authority. And through his resurrection and ascension, they're powerless against him. The reference to Psalm 68 reminds us how costly the gifts of grace that Jesus has provided for us actually are, but also how powerful they are. This reference to Psalm 68 reminds us how costly the, the gifts of grace that Jesus has provided for us. And now they talk to us about him as an exalted king. He shares his glory by giving us gifts to share with one another. And some of that in gifting includes words to teach, correct, build up, worship, encourage, pray. Some of that gifting is to be active in helping leading organizing, fixing, and creating. The Christian community is essential for the maturing of growth because Jesus has sovereignly given every individual special ability, gifting, to minister to all the other members. The second part of this in verses 11 to 16, God gives gifts of leadership to equip us for ministry together. Let's work our way through this long sentence and summarize what is stated here. It starts in chapter uh, uh, 4, verses 7 to 10, giving grace to every person. The focus is on one dimension of Jesus' gifting, a specific group who were to serve the church. It says in verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. In one shape or form, the leaders identified are expected to teach the scriptures and to encourage others to follow Jesus. Now, not all of the leadership roles are mentioned in this grouping, and we must be careful not to create a church structure on these roles. What's important here is that Jesus appoints them to lead. Now, I don't consider myself a pastor, 
because the church voted to hire me. I believe we need to be called by God to be in positions of leadership in the church. That's what the passage says. We must avoid setting up tiers of spirituality in churches. That would be divisive. And so we have to be careful here. When we read what these called leaders are required to do, we're actually brought back to the concept of unity in the church, not levels of division. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I recently shared two diagrams with a group of adults from our church who are taking a leadership development program called Growing Leaders. And the first image you see here is of how many of us perceive church life, or maybe even our own leadership. Someone in charge in that top circle, and the rest of us fill in the blanks below. But the other image is how scripture describes the church. Jesus is the head, and those he appoints to lead are all part of the body with everyone else, leaders and followers together. Their role as leaders is to inspire others to works of service and growth in their lives. The word equip means train, prepare, invest time heavily in developing and preparing fellow believers to engage in ministry in the body. According to the grammar of this text, the main thing leaders are to do is to equip others so that they can experience and do the next two things, the work of the ministry and building up the body. If you were to talk to our ministry staff here at DBC, they know that I'm not interested in having them work harder and do more. They know that I will ask them if they're investing in others and equipping them to do the ministry. Not so that they can be lazy, but to help people grow in these three areas from this text. Grow in unity of faith, knowing who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Growing in maturity, growing up to be like Jesus, never getting complacent. Growing in stature. That word in this passage, measure, would be used to describe a dugout of water so full, it's overflowing. Here it refers to overflowing in size. As in growing up as a person. We will never reach perfection in stature but we still are to pursue Jesus. When we equip people, we don't just give tools to relate to kids, organize a lesson, set budgets, or organize events. It's so that they will use the gifting given to them by God and learn to daily put their trust in him and rely on him. Here's what verses 14 to 16 say. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Here we read the ultimate purpose of giving gifts to all and having those called to equip them, building up the body. What the church wants to avoid, according to this text, is immaturity. A concern is raised about the influence here of false teaching to disrupt unity. Without the stability of growth, well, we're vulnerable like a boat adrift on a stormy sea, at the mercy of the waves that carry us far off course. Because the body is Jesus' manifest witness to the spiritual powers of, this, of the heavenly realms, of how significant the work of Jesus on the cross was, the church will constantly be under attack to fracture. And how we deal with our differences is very important. People will often quote, speaking the truth in love from this passage as a means to confront someone who is doing wrong. But when you read it in its context, 
It refers to making confessional statements and making a commitment together to stand on God's word out of care and concern for one another. What we learn in this section is that it's the responsibility of divinely gifted leaders to equip others for mutual service. The goal is to grow in Christ, doctrine, maturity, and to manifest love for one another. Well, in conclusion, there are several key points we need to uphold from this text about doing ministry together. The first thing I want to emphasize is the prominence of Jesus. Jesus remains the focus of our lives through this text. He's presented here as the victorious warrior conquering the power of sin and darkness. And it's through him, through faith in him, we receive forgiveness and new life to follow. He's the one who graces us with gifts. He's the focus of our pursuit. Not only the prominence of Jesus, but a united body is a focus here. Online church is what we can do right now. But online church can create in us a consumer mindset. I present, you listen. And maybe that, that can create in us no desire to connect, serve, and grow, but we need to connect, serve, and grow. There's another focus, the role of leaders who are to equip and serve. We expect excellence from paid leaders, but the goal of any church planter, or any encourager, pastor, teacher, is to raise up more of the same. Leaders must stop evaluating themselves by how much they do. They need to ask other questions. Am I equipping others to do ministry? Are others empowered to do ministry? Is ministry being done through the team? How successful are the people around me that I lead? There's one other focus, the purpose of ministry together. Ministry together in God's story can be boiled down to one thing. It's becoming like Jesus. May God use this text to do a number of things in our lives today and in the coming weeks. Correct wrong thinking about leadership. Renew a commitment to serve. Create a desire to grow closer to Christ. Thank God for bringing us into this unity. Be alert to immaturity in our faith. And an invitation to submit your life to follow Jesus. We have had another opportunity to meet together from our homes. We would like to send you into the week ahead with this blessing. Father, help us to live this week to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do. Amen. Amen.
Was a red. 